5 a.m. Eastern uh, from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Thank you very much. We have, uh, for those watching at home, we have about 150 people in the room here at Kennedy Space Center. The majority of them are NASA social media followers. Uh, we also have connected to us and tuning in social media followers from eight field centers across the country. The hashtag for today's event is simply Orion. That's also the hashtag uh, for uh, the test flight. Um, if you hear us talk about something that doesn't quite sound like Orion, if you still continue use that hashtag, uh, that would be appreciated. And we're going to be talking about things other than just Orion today at this briefing. We're also going to talk about, for example, our commercial crew program. Uh, soon, we're going to be flying U.S. astronauts on American spacecraft to the International Space Station and back. And also, we're going to be talking about our journey to Mars and how the Orion test flight is a stepping stone to that endeavor. So to get us kicked off, let us start with our first speaker. He is a veteran of four uh, space flight missions and also the director here at Kennedy Space Center. Please help me welcome to the stage, Bob Cabana. Thanks, man. Hey, are you guys ready to see history made tomorrow? Absolutely. So you realize that you've done the math. You know, we, our last flight to the moon was in 1972. It's been 52 years since we've had a human spacecraft, even though there isn't a crew member in it, go as far from planet Earth uh, as Orion is going tomorrow. That, that's pretty darn neat. This is our stepping stone to the future. This is our first step into deep space exploration, into going to Mars. And I think it's absolutely outstanding. Uh, the administrator is going to be here shortly. And before he does, I just want to tell you a little bit about some of the transformation going on here at the Kennedy Space Center, preparing for that future. I don't know if you had a chance to look out the window here on the uh, patio, but if you look out to launch pad 39B, the uh, northernmost pad, it's totally different from how it was during shuttle. All the shuttle infrastructure is off there. Those three big lightning protection systems, towers that are put in place, you know, that's the launch pad we're going to go to Mars from. You know, we're flying Orion on a Delta IV Heavy right now, but the Delta IV Heavy, the furthest it's going to get Orion away from Earth is 3,600 nautical miles, all right? It's going to re-enter about 85% lunar re-entry velocity, but that's the best we can do with the Delta IV. We're building a space launch system, and it's going to launch from that pad, and it's going to eventually take us to Mars from that launch pad right out that window. All the shuttle infrastructure is gone. It's got a new propellant distribution system, totally refurbished. It's got a refurbished water suppression system. It's got fiber optics. It's got new computers. It's going to have a new plane trench. That is the launch pad for the next 30 years. Over in the vehicle assembly building, right out the window here, High Bay 3, all the shuttle platforms are gone. And when we say platform, you know, you think about something the size of the floor of this room. That's not a platform. The platforms <laughs> in there are the size of small buildings. All that shell infrastructure is out of there. New platforms are going in to accommodate the space launch system. Now this rocket starts out at 70 to 90 metric tons, right? But it grows to 130. Well, those platforms are designed to accommodate the evolving outer mold line of the vehicle as it gets wider and taller up at the top. So those platforms are designed to adjust eight to 10 feet up and down, and they've got inserts in them so that as the outer mold line gets wider, you can pull out one insert, stick in another one, you don't have to redo everything. It's gonna be awesome. The crawler transporter, totally redone. Crawler transporter two, we got two of them. Crawler transporter two, got new wheel bearings in it to accommodate the heavier weights of the mobile launcher and the space launch system. It's got new jacking elevation and leveling cylinders. It's got new brakes. It's got new generators. It is totally being refurbished in our crawler transporter for another 30 years. It's going to take that mobile launcher that you see out next to the vehicle assembly building that's being modified for the space launch system. It's going to weigh about 6 million pounds. The rocket's going to weigh another 6 million pounds. The crawler transporter weighs 6 million pounds. That 18 million pounds is going to roll three miles out to Tab D. We're going to fuel that rocket, and in fiscal year 2018, we're going to be launching on Orion on another test flight, again without a crew, on its way to the moon. And at this time, I want to welcome our administrator, Charlie Bolton, to the stage. Thanks very much for everybody who's on the net. I understand there are people on from every NASA center around the country, I hope, anyway. Uh, real quick, because I know you all have questions you want to ask. Hopefully, Bob's giving you a lot of the technical stuff and all the details, so I'm not going to repeat anything. Uh, but again, I want to thank all of you for coming. 
Uh, it's a really exciting time for all of us, and I can only imagine how exciting it is for you. Did you already ask them how many people have done this before? No. How many of you have seen a launch of any kind before? Wow, this is pretty. Well, let me put it this way: Who's not seen a launch of any kind? All right. Yeah. Hey, now that's good. Okay. Uh, it's going to be pretty neat. So, uh, so that's an understatement. <laughs> but, uh, you, you said this morning what it was going to be. It, it is. It's going to be a BFD. But, but other than that, <laughs> Bob and I had the privilege earlier this morning of actually going out with both the ULA and, and Lockheed Martin and kind of standing right beneath the vehicle. And, and it is very, very, very impressive. So, again, thank you all for coming. Thanks for what you do. Um, why don't we try to go to questions? And since I've got Bob captured here, he's going to have to go do the work. And we have time for like two questions. So two! <laughs> we'll, we'll try the question, Charlie. Okay. Uh, hands, please. And a question's coming in from the hinterland. Uh, oh, no. According to uh, uh, Al Ward and what I've heard from him, uh, when the parachute failed on Apollo 15, it was due to uh, low winds that day allowing RCS fumes from the RCS fuel dump to travel up the lines up to the parachute. Has that been accounted for in the new arrived capsule design and how much redundancy is there for safety in case of shoot failure? You, you have just surpassed the technical knowledge that both Charlie and I <laughs> <laughs> This is why we have really smart people working for us who unfortunately are not here with us right and, now. And you, answer that you question. pick the two guys who really don't like using parachutes. <laughs> There's two pilots, and so we're just going to be we, very We didn't use a parachute, it was just a slow down on the runway. Slow down on the runway. So uh, we apologize, we'll get you an answer. Okay, okay. Don't, but, don't forget. But the, you know the answer to that? You don't? You're smart. Rex. Oh, man. We, Rex, but, Rex, Rex knows the answer. He'll tell you when he comes up. The parachutes were uh, designed uh, at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, it's a, a great design, they've been thoroughly tested. And I'm confident that they're going to work exactly as they were designed. We learned a lot about parachutes, but Mars. First off, thanks for uh, coming over here today and uh, spending some time with us. Um, I've seen in, in a few of the social media boards uh, a, a bunch of naysayers saying that this is not such a big deal and all this other stuff. How do you guys go ahead and re respond to somebody like that? I, I said it's a BFD. <laughs> <laughs> in, all, in all seriousness, it is, it is a big deal, and it's, it's a huge deal for the nation. Uh, when you stop and think that this will be the first time we've launched a vehicle in order to carry humans beyond Earth orbit in more than 40 years, people ask what's taken so long. So that is a legitimate question. Uh, to, to question whether it's a big deal or not, I, I don't think is, is fair or legitimate at all. Uh, it is a huge deal because this is a continuation of what the Apollo astronauts started. Uh, you know, I, I, when I talked to Neil Armstrong, when I did talk to Neil Armstrong and others, they went to the moon not just to go to the moon. They viewed, they viewed their lunar missions as a precursor for humans going on to other places, Mars being one of them. So uh, we have taken a 40-year hiatus in trying to make this trek, and now we're back on the path. I think for the first time, at least since Bob and I have been engaged in the space program, we're closer than 30 years away from, from going to Mars. And, and the team is really excited about it. When Charlie mentioned us that they were looking forward to Mars, even when they went on the moon, that first Apollo 11 crew you know, that went to the moon, the first crew that actually be on the surface, brought us a patch. We have a patch signed, and it's signed by the Apollo 11 crew to be taken. You know, It's for the crew to take to Mars when they go to Mars. And that was, that was back in 1969. They thought of that. Uh, you know, the other part of this is, if you look at the Apollo missions, the longest Apollo mission was like 12 days. The Orion capsule, it's bigger. It's designed for a crew of four. It has, with a crew of four, it has a 21-day uh, design life in space. It is a big deal. It's a, it's a much bigger design, and we know a lot more now than we knew back during the Apollo program to really make this our deep space vehicle. Right? Now, obviously, it has to hook up with a habitability module to be, you know, for extended periods of time, but with a crew too, we got at least 27 days with it. Who's here from somewhere other than the US? I, I know there are a lot. You know, you weren't a partner when we went to the moon. Uh, we didn't have any partners when we went to the moon. There was no commercial space when we went to the moon. So what is, what is big about this is that we have now reached out and we're engaging more people in actually being a part of this than I think many people ever dreamed of. 
when the, in the days of the Apollo era, uh, you know, the Cold War, uh, we were involved in a space race. We're not in a space race anymore, no matter what anybody tells you. There is, there is sort of a little space race, but that space race, thank goodness, is among American companies uh, trying to see who can be the best, who can be the most efficient, who can get the cost down the most, and they're forcing uh, you know, manufacturers around the world to take a look at, at their processes, at their pricing and everything. So that is a tremendous difference. We're, we're not only doing technological advances in terms of hardware, but we're doing game-changing advances in terms of business practices, how you do things, okay? And when I look at international partnerships, I look at the International Space Station, when you consider, you know, we got Russia, Canada, Japan, the is the the Earth, Space so. Agency, <laughs> and all those partners. You know, uh, we have learned how to work together in space, the agreements that had to go into place to make that happen, and I think it's a model for how we explore in space, how we work in space together, and it set the stage for how we're going to explore when we go beyond planet Earth. And as Charlie mentioned, I do have to throw this out. I think it's kind of cool. Uh, tomorrow is the um, 16th anniversary of the first space station assembly mission, and we're launching the very first mission on our new vehicle to explore beyond. Sorry, I did it. is truly in. Yeah, but that didn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie, Bob, this is a unique event. We actually have eight uh, space flight centers or NASA field centers on the line. We have a question from NASA Ames. Great. Go ahead, NASA Ames. Go ahead. Great, hey, we're uh, happy to be here and representing NASA Ames. We wanted to ask you what the significance of the name Orion is, and uh, it seems to pop up in a lot of programs, but it uh, is attached to this program. We want to find out a little bit more about why it was named Orion. I don't have a clue, but I'm gonna tell you what I read. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, and I just read this the other day, and I'm counting on, because it came from a media person, so I'm counting on being true and well-researched. <laughs> that is not tongue-in-cheek. Tongue -in Orion came about in the Constellation program, and, and the team at the time felt that what more appropriate to be a part of, of a Constellation program than to name it for a Constellation, Constellation Orion. So that's what I am, I am told that that's how the name came about. You know, subsequently, or most of the times we go out nowadays and we ask kids to help us name things. I think NASA named it in the world, but I don't know. It's Sounds good to me. Bob says it's close and he was still around, but that's the answer I got when I consulted one of my most valuable assets, which is U.S. media. <laughs> we'll come back to the room in a second. We have one more question from Field Center. We have a question from uh, Glenn Research Center. Glenn? Hi, um, can you tell us what factors go into the launch uh, uh, window? Because uh, you're not trying to rendezvous with anything. Uh, so could you just explain that to us, please? I think we got about a two and a half hour launch window on this one. And uh, it's, you know, I don't know what the, the end cutoff is, the requirement. I'm sure it's requirements on the vehicle and fueling and the other things. It depends on where they are in the count. If it were a shuttle, I could tell you precisely. But uh, yeah, I don't know what the limiting factor is on why it's where it is. But the weather forecast for tomorrow is 70% go. Uh, the weather off the California coast is great for recovery. Uh, with a two and a half hour launch window, I'm, Fairly confident we're going to find time to get off. Rex, where are you? Are you is Rex coming on next? No, you later. later. Okay, go find out. Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> why did we pick Orion as a name? And and so you can answer his question about why two and a half hours instead of all day. They want to have the, uh, the good lighting constraints for the landing also in the uh, Pacific. Ah. <laughs> Spoken as a true expert. Did, did you uh, come get a, get a mic real quick? Here you go. Come on up, Rex. I know you're you're cheating. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Explain that. So I wish your answer there. It's a it's kind of a complicated uh, calculus they have to go into because they have to maintain the ability to launch the vehicle from here, but they also have to have the ability to retrieve it. And uh, we're trying this out for the first time. This is not easy to pull a vehicle into a well bed ship the way we're recovering it. So they have to have enough crew to be there, enough lighting out from the Pacific to recover in time. So I think that kind of narrows down the window. Great. See, I, I would have guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it would have been a guess. And Rex is a current active astronaut. He's been involved in all this stuff, so he's going to give you all that. Okay. We, we have time. We have time for one more question, uh, and then I know the administrator has to run. So. This is easy for anyone. I'm curious to know, are there any scientific 
experiments or missions that we're leveraging as part of this test launch, so even though it's a test launch, are there even some short experiments that we're sending out? The one that I'm most proud of is coming out of something called the, uh, the Exploration Design Challenge. And, uh, and the scientists are high school students from the Hampton Coast, Virginia area who won the Exploration Design Challenge co-sponsored by Lockheed Martin and NASA, where we went out and said, look, we, um, radiation is one of the biggest challenges for us. Radiation and, and its potential damage to the crew. Can somebody help us come up with a way to protect the crew during long duration flights to Mars? And, um, and there were like 25,000 responses within a day I think in the end we had 100,000 or so contestants and, and an expert panel of people picked the five finalists. So all five teams should be uh, here at the Cape for the launch in the morning. And the winning team from the Hampton Roads area near Langley uh, Research Center actually have their experiment inside Orion being flown. So that's one science experiment that I know is being done. The other experiments uh, relate to, to um, thermodynamics. We're looking at the heat shield and whether or not it is strong enough to withstand the temperatures and pressures of reentry in, in, in about an 85% uh, scenario for coming back from the moon. Um, we're looking at it, its communications and other stuff, looking at the navigation and control on board during the flight. And then the, going back to the parachutes, uh, that, that really is aerodynamics. And so we're looking at, we're looking at essentially um, high-speed aerodynamics, the performance of the parachutes as they try to open uh, in a case where we're coming back, you know, starting out at 20,000 miles per hour and be so. It, it's a great test flight. I mean, we're looking at separation of the launch board system, the panels on the uh, service module. It's got 1,200 sensors on it that are specific for getting data. There's like 50 miles of wiring just for the sensors uh, that are unique to this flight for gathering data. Any of you sailors? Uh, okay, you know how when you're trying to go back and forth and you're trying to get to something in the ocean and you're you're doing this mental gymnastics, you're doing the trigonometry and the geometry in your brain? Yeah. Uh, we've got the crew of the USS Anchorage that is um, uh, a helicopter. Well, it's, a, it's a, an amphibious readiness vehicle that carries Marines around the world, and they're getting ready to deploy, but before they deploy, uh, they're actually going to recover the vehicle tomorrow afternoon. And having been aboard, uh, watching them go through one of the final exercises, it was actually incredible to watch this crew, uh, the navigator working with the, the officer of the deck underway to determine exactly where they go and how they approach the capsule it's floating out there. They had to take winds into consideration, the, the you know the drift of the of the ocean waves and all this other kind of stuff, so that when they got there, the vehicle wouldn't go zipping by them, and they wouldn't have to do U-turns and everything else. So it's um, it is an it is an art as much as a science just to pick the vehicle up. And I didn't even mention that in the test, but this will be a very important test for the U.S. Navy to make sure that they understand how do we successfully pick up this vehicle because a couple of flights from now, it's actually gonna have people in it. And we wanna make sure that we pick them up as quickly as we can, first pass, so we can get them out of that thing because they will have been you know, in space uh, around the moon and doing all kinds of stuff. And we really wanna get them out as quickly and safely as we can. So this is a, a that's probably the final test for the vehicle uh, is to see if we can integrate the Navy in and make this successful pick up. So that's it. You all have been great. Thanks so much for letting Bob and me come. Thank you.